Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That's a chicken. She's a fat one. She's doing practically all the things a chicken can do. And besides all this cleverness, she's about to perform her primary function. She's going to be a dinner. The lady who carries the bird in her left hand is named Abby Durfee Borden, stepmother to Emma and Lizzie Borden. Mrs. Borden weighs over 200 pounds. The curved-handled axe she holds in her right hand is her favorite when she goes out amongst the chickens. Her favorite because with it she does such a neat job. Which is more than I can say for the person who murdered Mrs. Borden and her husband, Mr. Borden. So tonight, my report to you on the bloody, bloody banks of Fall River. Crime Classics. A new series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland. Connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The place is Fall River, Massachusetts, at the start of a hot August in 1892. In that era, it was a town whose dominant color was brown, the color of sun-dried lawns, of rain-stippled brick and board, of ladies' dresses that reached from neck to pavement. Next in popularity, as far as color went, was black. It was a stern time and a stern place, and bleak, where certain types of smiles were suspect and where women only dared to stretch in the privacy of kitchen or boudoir. It was a time, too, when 18 was the age of marriage, and a single woman of 32 had to find surcease in this way. Breaking saloon's windows. Knitting. Secretly tearing from the newspaper the latest picture of John L. Sullivan. Also, Jim Corbett, who was rumored to be more of a gentleman. Or this way. Till death thy endless mercy seal. Lizzie Borden's way. And make the sacrifice complete. Amen. Amen. There now. How did you like that hymn? Oh, very much, Reverend Job. And then I shall write my brother to send me the rest of the new ones from New York. I trust your judgment, Miss Borden, implicitly. How is your brother? Oh, he's getting married. Married? Didn't I tell you? No. No, you didn't. I'm sorry. I think, Reverend, you might have let me know in another way. Less blunt. But you don't even know my brother. I hope he'll be very happy. I'm sure you do. Reverend. Yes, Miss Lizzie? And how much longer will you grieve? Dear Miss Lizzie. Your wife is gone now for four years. Dear, dear Miss Lizzie. How kind is your concern. Still let me prove thy perfect will. My acts of faith faith and and love love repeat. repeat. Till Till death death thy endless mercy seal. Yo, 
your father likes chicken, Lizzie. Chicken he shall get. Glad you came out to the backyard. You can do something for me besides picking pears from the tree. You're just jealous because you can't eat pears, Mrs. Borden, because you break out. Where you been, Lizzie? With the Reverend Mr. Jubb. He got some new hymns from New York. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Oh, if I was a true mother to you instead of a stepmother, I'd tell you right out you're never going to get married, Lizzie. New hymns from New York, your work with the fruit and flower mission, none of these are going to help. If I was a true mother to you, I'd tell you all of those things, but tenderly. Yes, Mrs. Borden. And it eats inside you, doesn't it, stepdaughter? Yes, Mrs. Borden. You and your sister Emma, old maids. They say that about you. Did you know that? Yes. Yes, Mrs. Borden. Here. Least you can do is some work. You can pluck a chicken as well as anyone. Yeah, well, I do the other. Get used to being useful. That's a way to live, too. Take it. All right. Mrs. Borden? What is it? Aren't you concerned about yesterday? What about yesterday? About the barns being broken into. Some children, probably. Why should they break into the barn? Looking for iron for sinkers so they could fish. Not so delicate, Lizzie. You do it this way. This way. I told Mr. Jubb about the milk. What are you talking about? About the milk. What about it? You've been in this sun too long, Mrs. Borden. Burned your memory away. About the milk. It's being poisoned. <gasps> poisoned? Why else do you think everyone in the family got sick day before yesterday? You didn't. I don't drink milk. And the barn's being ransacked. There's someone who wants to do us harm. <laughs> Make your fancy, stepdaughter. Someone who hates my father. <laughs> your father said a man at the bank had cursed him. <laughs> father said he'd seen the man loitering about. Oh, now we've come to it, haven't we? What? Now we've brought the conversation around. What? Your father. Tell you something. He doesn't care for you. <laughs> he doesn't care for you at all. He loves me. Not at all. <gasps> What's the matter? Blood. All over my hands. Blood. Oof. Chicken blood. It'll wash off. That's the trouble with you, Lizzie. You shudder your way through. <gasps> what did you do that for? What did you smear that blood on my face for? To see how you look, Mrs. Borden. This is not exactly a healthy relationship between two grown people. But, let's face it, the possibility of a lady's liking another lady in the Borden household was pretty remote. First of all, after the widowed Mr. Borden married Abby, he told his two daughters to do everything Abby told them. And often, Abby would order Lizzie to do things right in the middle of plucking a pear from the backyard tree. And Lizzie dearly loved the pears from the backyard tree. Also, it was a constant source of wild hilarity for Abby that Neither of her stepdaughters had been taken as bride. She'd gotten married, but Lizzie never did, nor Lizzie's sister, Emma. And sometimes Lizzie would go to her father's room, and she'd ask him How this. How can you stand her? She takes care of my needs, and she cherishes me. She's a hulk. When seen through the eyes of affection... Oh, father! It's much too late to ask you to love her, Lizzie. But I insist that this kind of conversation concerning my wife shall be the last. Whatever you say, Father. Now, it's very hot. I think I lie down. I'll take off your shoes. Never mind. I want to. Very well. Father. Yes? Tell me about my mother, my real mother. Oh, Lizzie, Please. it's been so Please. long. I've forgotten. You have not. Yes, 
Yes, I have. No. She was very lovely. She had brown hair. She had brown eyes, and she was slender. You used to tell me... Father. What? Why did you let her die? She had a sickness for you which... You let the... her die. You could have saved her, and you let her die. Lizzie! And you married that Hulk. I forbid you... Father, father, listen to I me. I forbid you to speak of my wife in such a manner. Let's go away from here, father. Away? Yes, you and I. Give that woman this house, and we'll go away. Father... You'll go away, not me. What? You speak often of quitting this house. I'm going to live with a friend. Do it. You can't mean it. Do it. Good night. Father. Father. I want you to know I always love you. No matter what you say to me. I know. And I'm sorry for you. Good night, Lizzie. It was the night of August 3rd in the year 1892. A stifling night, humid, sleepless, and filled with drone. A million small sounds, continuous and insistent, made up of insects and dry grass and moist night clothes against moist bedding. And in the middle room of the second floor of number 92 Second Street, Lizzie Borden walked. And walked and grew warmer and walked. And Lizzie Borden wept, her face pressed to the earth, she wept. And in a little while, for some reason or another, she got up and walked over to the pear tree and plucked a pear and ate it and smacked her lips, sweet with juice, at the moon. Lizzie Borden. listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. This Saturday night, CBS Radio's Gangbusters presents the story of the Soda Fountain Pigeon. Also Saturday nights on most of these same stations, don't miss the exciting adventures of United States Marshal Matt Dillon on Gunsmoke. Gangbusters and Gunsmoke, Saturday nights at the Star's Address, hear both for twice the excitement. And now once again, Thomas Hyland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the bloody, bloody banks of Fall River. I'd like to give you a brief rundown on the Borden family. Let's pick the last day all of them were alive, August 4th, 1892. Let's say about 7 o'clock in the morning. Andrew Jackson Borden yawning. A.J. Borden is the head of the house and worth over a quarter of a million dollars. He's getting up now and getting ready to go to the bank so he can be near some of it. Lace me up, Andrew. Abby Durfee Borden, just before lacing up. Abby is 64 years of age and hadn't gone downstairs without a corset since the age of 15. Lizzie Borden, still asleep. Night clothes on the chair where she left them last night. And dreamless. Woman in bed. There are two other people I must mention. 
There's Bridget Sullivan, the maid, who is making the mutton soup for breakfast. And Emma Borden, sister to Lizzie, who's off on a trip to Fairhaven in behalf of the fruit and flower mission. We know that the Bordens, all of them, had their breakfast. We know that Mr. Borden left the house at 9 o'clock for the bank. And we know that Bridget washed the windows in the attic. And we know that as Bridget sat on the windowsill, washing in such a way that a good part of her was hanging over 2nd Street, Lizzie Borden was inside holding her feet so Bridget wouldn't fall. And we know, too, that there was conversation. I don't feel so good. Why? What's the matter? My stomach still hurts when I press it. It's from the other day. When the milk was poisoned? No, I don't think it was the milk. It was the bananas. I think Mrs. Borden fried them too long. And I always say that bananas fried too long in mutton soup don't go well together. Oh, help me inside, Lizzie. Here. Here. Press me. Here. Oh! You see? Well, then you should lie down, Bridget, and sleep. Oh, if I could, I would. But I got these windows to do. You just uh, lie down here in your room and sleep. Oh, but... Oh, you do what I tell you. If you mean it, there's nothing I'd like better. I mean it. I'd better inform Mrs. Borden where I'll be no. in case... No. Oh, I'd better? No. Mrs. Borden is going out soon. Going out? Oh, she did now and I'm napping. I really do. Here. I'll turn down your bedclothes. In. In with you. Now you just go to sleep. Saying that to Bridget. You go right to sleep. Saying a thing like that was like putting chloroform under Bridget's nose. She was a snoozer, that one. When she worked, she worked, but get her on a feather bed, good night all, off she went. Lizzie tucked her in and watched over her for a few minutes, and then Lizzie went downstairs and into the guest room. Hello, Mrs. Borden. What do you want, Lizzie? I thought you'd gone out. What made you think that? I just thought so. And now what do you want? What are you doing in this room, Mrs. Borden? And why shouldn't I be here? Bridget could make up the guest room. You don't have to... You know very well Bridget is not allowed to clean any of the rooms on the second floor. Oh, yes, I... But Father's coming home. That's strange. The side door's locked. He can't get in. It's never locked this time of day. Hurry! Just a minute! Haven't you got a key? Why is the side door locked? I don't know. Haven't you got a key? No. Come down and open the door. Uh, Try the front one. All right. Wait a minute. It's locked. I'll send Lizzie down. Go down and open the door for your father. A vacuum in time. Here is where truth ends and knowledge. On August the 4th, 1892, at number 92 Second Street in the town of Fall River, Massachusetts, the time between 10 and 11.15 a.m. is lost. Lost, that's the only word for it. Wrenched somehow out of the rest of time and lost. And started again when that happened. when that was spoken. Did you call me, Miss Lizzie? Come downstairs, quickly! Someone came into the house and murdered Father! What? What did you say? Someone has murdered Father! Murdered him? With an axe. No, no, don't go in there. Go across the street and get Dr. Brown. Quickly. Mrs. Churchill! Mrs. Churchill! Please, come over. Someone has hit Father with an axe and killed him. Come in through the front door. It's open. Your 
father. In the sitting room, on the sofa. Come. You see? Oh, you'd better call for Mr. Harrington to the police. Yes? Who's that? It's me. It's Bridget. Dr. Bowen will be over. May I say something? Of course. Mr. Harrington of the police should know about this. Uh, perhaps Mrs. Borton should know of this first. She's not here. She's out on a sick call. Where is everybody? Oh, in here, Dr. Bowen, the sitting room. Your father is quite dead, my dear. Yes. I suggest you so inform the police. Inform Mr. Harrington. I'll, I'll see to it. You're very kind. This next will be pretty hard to take, but you just have to believe it. I've got the records right here to prove it. Not only was Mr. Harrington not to be found, but there was hardly any cop at all in Fall River. At this very moment, most of them were taking part in the annual excursion of the Fall River Police Association at a shore resort at Rocky Point, which is near Providence, Rhode Island. So, even as Mrs. Churchill was yelling her lungs out for a policeman, they were running sack races, splitting up into quartets for singing purposes, and the more athletic were getting their mustaches wet in the Atlantic Ocean. However, a Marshal Hilliard, who had gotten up too late to meet the trolley, which met the excursion train, was sulking around town, and he's the one Mrs. Churchill spotted. She brought him back to number 92 Second Street. Here, the marshal viewed the body, gave condolences to Lizzie, and set about looking for clues. During his search, Mrs. Churchill made a remarkable discovery. Lizzie? Yes, Mrs. Churchill? I've just been up on the second floor. Yes. Your mother's up there. She's not my mother. She's my stepmother. She's dead. She's my stepmother. It looks like somebody took an axe and... Well, she's dead. It was quite a troop who went upstairs to look in on Mrs. Abby Borden. There was Lizzie and Bridget and Marshall Hilliard... Then there was Mrs. Russell and Mrs. Bowen and several other ladies who happened in off the street. Then there was Dr. Bowen, and in a little while, the Reverend Mr. Jubb happened in. The latter was the kindest of all to Lizzie. Finally, toward dusk, Mr. Harrington did appear, sun-tanned and sandy and with both his striped bathing suits folded neatly in a strong brown paper. He took charge, and he asked Lizzie where her sister was. In Fairhaven doing work for the Fruit and Flower Mission. Had her sister been there at the time her mother was murdered? She's not my mother. She's my stepmother. Very well, but where were you, Lizzie Borden? In the barn, getting a piece of iron. For what? Sinkers for my fishing. The whole morning? And in the garden. How did you happen to find your father dead? I was bringing him a pair. And the doctor? I would say your father was killed an hour and a half after your mother. What about that, Lizzie Borden? She's not my mother. She's my stepmother. Who do you think killed them, then? The same man who poisoned the milk. The same man who broke into the barn. The same man who my father saw loitering. Don't you think it's strange that Bridget was asleep and your sister out of town and you out in the garden, all of you out of the way for one hour and a half while your parents are murdered? Mrs. Borden cannot rightly be called a parent of mine. And these were the questions asked, and these the answers. Harrington asked them, the coroner asked them, the prosecuting attorney asked them. Yes, indeed, Lizzie was tried for murder, so there was a prosecuting attorney, and he asked them. These questions and a lot more. The trial lasted 13 days, and Lizzie Borden was adjudged not guilty. So, if Lizzie Borden was declared not guilty, we must assume this is the way our unknown murderer operated. Hot day on a busy street in Fall River. Murderer walking down it, carrying axe.
Mrs. Borden disposed of. Wait one hour and a half. Then... Mr. Borden. Then... And there he goes. Murderer covered with blood, carrying a bloody axe. And no one noticed him. Or they'd go yelling for Mr. Harrington. No one did. So the murderer was never found. And Lizzie? She never married. She embraced other things. Till death thy endless mercy seal. and make the sacrifice complete. Amen. just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about our next crime classic. Fall River, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Irene Tedrow was heard as Lizzie Borden. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Betty Harford, Sarah Selby, Herb Butterfield, William Johnstone, and Paul Fries. Bob Lamont speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Rudgeley, England in the year 1855, and a brilliant young medical man whose hobby was dead people and live racehorses. My report to you will be on The Hangman and William Palmer. Who won? Thank you. Good night. Tomorrow night, Van Johnson stars in the Thursday theater production of The Old Man's Bride. It's a modern John Alden romance with loads of surprises, as the man sent to fetch a bride for another learns plenty from a latter-day Priscilla with a strong mind of her own. It's the Thursday Theater, presented by CBS Radio tomorrow night on most of these same stations. Thursday night's Marlena Dietrich stars in Time for Love on the CBS Radio Network.